I'd like to ask everybody to open up in their Bibles to Mark the 12th chapter. That's where we're going to be at this morning, Mark chapter 12. It is good to see everybody with us. We do have some visitors that are traveling through. We also have some visitors that have been with us for a while and are passing through uh, once again, and so it's always good to see them. As we say every Sunday, though, it's no matter your presence, no matter your reason for being here, we're always happy that you've stopped by to take some time and worship God primarily, but also to worship alongside us. That's always a great time to be together, and it's always much appreciated by us and the members here. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28. This is not an unfamiliar passage. It's not something that is not repeated elsewhere, but I do want to kind of zero in on Mark's account of what happens here. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, saying, What commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered and said, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second, notice he asked for one, Jesus gives him two. He said, The second is like this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment that is greater than these. And the scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, that there is no one else besides him. That's a foundational Jewish belief. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. I love how this guy just kind of adds his own coding on the back end, which Jesus obviously appreciates. Because in verse 34, he answers back to him and says, You are not far from the kingdom of God. As I mentioned a second ago, this is not a passage that's unfamiliar to a lot of the other gospel accounts. I think Matthew has a version of this. Luke has some version of this as well. But what this essentially happens, or what this essentially comes from, is a string of challenges that people give towards Jesus. You have the Herodians that do this. You have the warrior that comes up to Jesus asking him questions. And this one is the hardest while also being the easiest one of all. He asks him, quite frank, what is the greatest commandment? And I think sometimes we look at this and say, well, this is a question that is being asked in a vacuum. This is a guy that's just trying to kind of corner Jesus a little bit. I don't think that's really what's happening here. This is a debate that the Jews would have had in the centuries leading up to this. It's certainly a debate they have then. And I think in some religious circles, people still wonder, if I could only pick one commandment, what would it be? Jesus, as we know, kind of cheats the situation. He doesn't say just one. He gives multiple or gives one that kind of encompasses everything. But his answer is very umbrella-like. It covers a lot of different things. He says, if you want to know what the greatest commandment is, it's twofold. Number one, you need to love God, and you also need to love your neighbor. And I don't think any of us have issues with that. You are here this morning, I would argue, because you love God. And if you're not here because you love God, mean you probably should have a conversation. I'm totally fine with that. Maybe let's talk through some of those types of things. But I think probably most of us are here because we do love God. It's the second one of those... Sometimes we have an issue with, because while we have no problem loving God, because after all, he's perfect, he's all-knowing, he's omnipotent, it's the loving your neighbor aspect that is difficult primarily when we personalize it. Because when Jesus says love your neighbor, instantly our minds go and we think, well, what about that guy over there? I'm not pointing at anybody out there. What about that guy over there? Because that guy really makes me mad. I don't like that guy at all. I'm still thinking about the guy that cut me off going into Taco Bell a few weeks ago. I don't like that guy. So when he says, love God and also love your neighbor, half of that, no problem with. It's a second part. And that, I think, as we talk about our relationships with the world around us, is really kind of a sticking point. How is it that we love our neighbor? Well, fortunately, Jesus puts a qualifier on that statement, doesn't he? He doesn't just say, love God. He also says, love your neighbor as yourself. Think about what he says there in that passage. Most of us, as we did, we just kind of did a second ago, most of us just kind of read through this section. We read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We kind of read through it and we think, okay, love God, love your neighbor. But we never really think about that qualifier as loving God as yourself. How does that phrasing change that narrative? How does that phrasing change that commandment? How does it change it in your own mind? Because if I'm being honest, I think a lot of us probably have some issues in regards to this. We think to ourselves, well, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy. Maybe the problem isn't those people, and I know I'm stepping on some really uber-millennial ground here, but maybe the problem is I don't really love myself. Most recent surveys will put the idea of self-esteem with problems that we have in America with self-esteem as anywhere from 70 to 85% of the population. There's a lot of people that have really big issues with themselves. And so to say to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, 
That presents a kind of a challenge, and yet you see it in relationships all the time. There are all sorts of people who will go into relationship counseling, who will go into marital counseling, and they'll say, this person just is abusive, they're hateful, they're spiteful, and almost always it boils back to something with that person. I just don't, I don't like who I am. I don't like what I've done. I don't like what I've become. And so we project it onto other people. Unless you think that this is some kind of issue that's just kind of isolated here in Mark the 12th chapter, there are other passages that talk about this. We just mentioned this in terms of a relationship and a husband and wife. But if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Paul presupposes the idea that you love yourself in regards to relationships with your spouse. He says in verse 28, Husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He just assumes that that's a fact. And then he said he loves his own wife, loves himself. It's a demonstration of what that love is. And then he once again assumes, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Think to your own marriage right now, those of you who are married, or those of you who are in any kind of romantic relationship. Think to yourself, is this something that I think about? Do I treat my spouse like I treat myself? And for those of you who aren't in any romantic relationships, you can also see this in Matthew the 7th chapter and verse 12, a verse that is called the golden rule. My mother forced me to memorize it. Obviously, she did not force my older brothers to memorize it, but I was forced to memorize it. Because he says in this passage, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way that they want or that you want them to treat you. Apparently I didn't memorize it. For this is the law and the prophets. Think about that passage real quick. How we treat other people is, at least in some ways, we've seen it now in three different verses, how we treat other people in some ways is a projection of what we think about ourselves. And so I would challenge us, as we have this lesson this morning that is designed to be very introspective, I would challenge you to think this morning deeply, what is your opinion about yourself? What is your attitude about yourself? Are you still somebody who is rattled with guilt? If you're a Christian, that's a conversation you need to have as well. Are you somebody who is rattled with shame and who's somebody who's carrying a burden? Are you somebody who is just constantly thinking about the person that you need to or that used to be? Or are you thinking about somebody that's forgiven? What do you think about yourself? And as I say this, once again, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking one of two things. You're thinking this is either some as we mentioned earlier, some uber millennial stuff, which is all just about kind of loving yourself and, and ooey gooey feelings, or you may think that this entire discussion that we're having this morning is utterly sinful. And I love it with you. There are some people who would argue that this whole discussion about loving yourself flies right in the face of everything that Scripture teaches. And I love it with you on that. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to show the difference here with what we're talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3, rather. In this passage, Paul is giving the young evangelist several different types of Admonitions. He has lots of things to say to him. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter three, starting in verse one. As he's giving his parting words towards Timothy, he says in verse one, "Realize this, Timothy, that in the last days difficult times will come. It's just an in inevitability. Men will be. And notice the very first thing on the list that he says: men will be lovers of self." They will also be lovers of money. They will be boastful. They will be arrogant. They will be revilers. They will be disobedient to parents. They will be ungrateful. They will be unholy. They will be unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. If you picked a number of biblical villains out of the text, you would find all of these people. You would find people who are just lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, Paul would talk about these people in Philippians chapter 3 as the Pharisees being pigs. He would talk about them being self-deluded. People are only obsessed with what is in their own belly. That's what he's talking about. And as you continue on in this passage, he says in verse 6, For among them are those who enter into households. These are people who captivate weak women, date weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, do you have a couple examples of that, Paul? Yes, he does. Just as, verse 8, Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So these men also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regards to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus's and Jambres's folly was also. Why did we read all those verses? The verse and the point that I was trying to make starts in verse 2. Why did we read all the way down through verse 9? 
It's because I wanted you to see the progression of this thought. Where he ends with, in verse 9, are two men, Janus and Jambres, who according to Jewish tradition, were the two sorcerers that opposed Moses the very first time Moses showed up at Pharaoh's doorstep. And Moses was bringing an actual miracle, an actual sign from God to their doorstep. And these people, knowing the difference between the truth and a lie, chose to embrace the lie. Well, why did they do that? It's obvious. Anybody who's been in any kind of royal courtroom or knows anything about presidential circles or any kind of those aristocratic areas, they know that those people's only purpose, their only job, is to secure the favor of the person in power. So they did it because of pleasure. They did it because that's what Pharaoh wanted them to hear. People who exchange the truth for a lie so they can save their own skin. That's how false doctrine progresses. That's how heresy develops. Where does it begin? It begins with an overt love of self. And so when he's talking about these false teachers here in verse 2, he's not just talking about this person and this person and this person and this person. He's talking about how it begins with the idea of lovers of self and going into false doctrine, lovers of pleasure, people who are greedy, people who are idolatrous. But it begins with this full-throated love and desire to gratify yourself. How is that any different than what we're talking about? The difference that I'm talking about this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is I am not talking about an idolatrous love of self. I am talking about a respect for who you are because of the fact that God made you. So yes, in a lot of ways this morning, I am talking about loving ourselves. I'm talking about developing a healthy self-image, but I'm not talking about it because I watched Dr. Phil all week. I don't even, does Dr. Phil even still around? I don't even know. Maybe I just pulled that idea out of thin air. I'm talking about loving ourselves because God made us. Look in Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis chapter one. You know where I'm going with this, but I want to really focus your attention on what he talks about here. I'm going to get seven people telling me when Dr. Phil is on the air as people leave service this morning. I can already see it coming. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. He says, in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God then, verse 27, created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created him. Did you ever notice the intricacies in this verse? It's easy to miss if you're just kind of reading through, which most of us do. If you've started daily Bible reading at any year, maybe that was your New Year's resolution, you've probably read Genesis 1 a thousand times. But you ever noticed the intricacies of this? For instance, in verse 27, three different times in that single verse, it says that he created them in his own image. Why does he say that? Well, it's obviously a triple repetition for importance sake. He wants us to see something there. Well, what is it that he wants us to see? Verse 26, that he created us in his own image. And now, I'll level with you for a long time in my earlier years, and shamedly even into probably my teenage, my 20 years, maybe a couple weeks ago, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other, but I used to think when he said God made man in his own image, I thought arms and legs. That's just what I assumed. It's not what he means at all, is it? When he talks about that he made God or made man in his own image, he's talking about the same set of values, the same perspective. He's making man to be a reflection of himself, something Hebrews talks about. And you also see in New Testament circles, when you look at the book of Acts, how Christianity reflects this same type of notion. The idea that God made man in his own image, and then Christianity are called Christians because they look and resemble who Christ is. And so in so many ways, our very existence and our creation of this earth is designed to imitate that of our creator. That is not a concept that scripture takes lightly. When you fast forward to chapter 9, for instance, he talks about the importance of this concept. And Genesis hits on this several times subtly. But in Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the whole earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every burst of the beast of the earth, on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. But every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you, as I gave the green plants. Only you shall not, verse 4, eat the flesh with its life because it is blood. In essence, eating blood or drinking blood is the consuming of another person. That's kind of the insinuation there. Verse 5, surely I will require your lifeblood, from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will also require the life of man. Now he's dipping into murder. 
and the consequence of murder. Verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. Well, why is that? Because in the image of God, he has made man. The Old Testament has a concept known as the blood avenger, where you have somebody who has killed somebody, and as a result of murder or homicide that's been given inside the land, there has to be some kind of justice. And the way that the Old Testament talks about it is almost as if a thirst for it. There's something that is not satisfied until that murder or that homicide has been taken care of. The whole reason for that is because something that was made in the image of God has been destroyed. And an affront on thing that's made in the image of God is almost an affront on God himself. Modern times people will talk about, well, why are so many Christians anti-abortion? Well, there's lots of reasons why Christians are anti-abortion, but one of the big reasons is because that is a person, that is a being that is made in the image of God. And to eliminate that is to cause a direct attack on God himself. Why do I love myself? It hasn't anything to do with the fact that I won the intramural volleyball tournament in seventh grade for my band room. Represent. That has nothing to do with it. The reason I love myself is because I'm made in the image of God, but I'm also remade. Jeremiah has a lot of allusions that are specifically towards the exile. And there's kind of difficult to parse them sometimes when you read in Jeremiah. You're thinking, is he talking about the exile? Is he talking about us? Look in Jeremiah 31. A lot of the mentions here in this book have to do with the new covenants especially in this chapter have to do with the new covenants in jeremiah chapter 31 starting in verse 1 what i want you to get from this section is the love that god has for us really kind of the whole idea of this entire thing in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting verse 1, he says, At that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. Is he talking physical, spiritual? I think he's talking spiritual. And they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest, the Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Again, verse 4, I, have, I will build you. You will be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines, and you will go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. And again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The planters will plant. You will enjoy them. For there will be a day when watchmen... On the hills of Ephraim, call out and say, Arise and let us go up to Zion. The Lord is our God. The reason that he's talking about this through the vein of the exile is he's talking to a broken people. People physically who have no hope of ever coming back without the direct intervention of God. And people who physically have no identity of what it even means to be a Jew. And tell me that's not how some of us feel sometimes. When we're alienated from God, this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, when our sins, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, have separated us from God, tell me that's not how we feel. Anybody in this room who has ever committed any kind of sin knows the despair and shame that almost always follows with it within seconds. And you think to yourself, is there any way that God could possibly love me? Physically, he's talking in the book of Jeremiah to people who know exactly how you feel. And just like physically he restored those people from exile, so spiritually he can restore you as well. The greatest example of this, in my opinion, in the entire Old Testament is in the book of Hosea. When God tells Hosea to go marry a harlot, something that nobody would have ever done for a billion different reasons, and then when that harlot inevitably leaves in chapters 2 and 3, in chapter 4, God tells him, go buy her back. Hosea chapter 4 is five verses long, all of which... Talk about how God loves Israel and the links that God will go to to bring those people back. These are things that I want us to think about, but not only all of this. I love myself because God loved me. I heard one time somebody say, this is a sermon, I've, I've used it, I've stolen it, I've totally plagiarized it, I'm making it all right right now, I've taken this illustration from somebody else, but I remember hearing a preacher a long time ago say that one of the best ways to read John chapter 3.16 is not to say it in terms of how great it is for the world, but to personalize it. You know John 3.16. You're familiar with it. If you don't, football season is fast upon us. Look in the end zone. John 3.16 will be up in some billboard out there. I promise you in the end zone. John 3.16 says very simply, For God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We're not going to parse that right now. But personalize that. For God so loved me, that if I believe in him, 
I will not perish, but I will have everlasting life. Have you thought about the magnitude of that statement? He also went on to say right after that, that if you were to imagine the fact that you were the only one that sinned, God would still send his son to die for you. That's a love that, that we can't fathom. And in 1 John chapter 3, it's a love that John would arguably spend his whole life trying to fathom. John the Apostle was a young man when Jesus was around. He's probably 17, 25 years old. That's the range that most people will give. By the time he writes 1 John, he's in the 70s and 80s. And so in 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, you can tell he's still almost grappling with just how great the love of God is. And so he says in 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. That's a magnificent statement. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it does not know God. Beloved, we are now children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know then that we appears, or when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Notice he's talking about the relationship of us with him, and how there's that intimacy, that reflection. Verse 3, everyone who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. John is talking about things that would play in every pulpit across America. And everybody in the world would talk about how great God is and how much he loves you. And they would try to hammer that home through verses and verses and verses. But John qualifies it. Because in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, right before he talks about the magnificent love of God, he says, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him and shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone else who practices righteousness is born of him. Do you notice the progression for these three points? You may look at me and say, well, Brady, you always have three points in your sermon. That's exactly right. That's because it works for me in my brain. But these are all three sequential. God made me. He remade me. And my life is an obedient love towards him. Those last two points go hand in hand. That's where salvation intersects. Is the idea that we serve him, we worship him because we love him, and we are reborn into his image. I would argue that None of these points are really new material. I don't think I'm standing up here talking about the love of God, the fact that God made us, that he remade us. That he I don't think any of that is new. But remember three hours ago where we started this sermon. We started it by talking about the love that we have for other people. And we've taken all these in terms of self. I love myself because God made me, because God remade me, because God loved me. But every single one of those things can apply to other people. I love others. This is the cleanest I can make it, by the way. I love others because God made them. I love others because God can remake them. I have to see that potential in everybody. And I love others because God loved them. Jesus Christ died to save them just as he died to save me. The difference is, is can we get people to mold themselves in his image? Can we help them become more obedient to them? If we don't love them, we won't even try. But all of that begins with an understanding that God loves me. And so I'm sitting here this morning challenging you with that very idea. And you may be sitting here thinking analytically, academically, I understand this. No question here. I understand God loves me. Do you really do you really understand the depths of which God went to to show and to demonstrate and give his love to you? Because once we do, it changes our outlook on self. And once it changes our outlook on self, it changes our outlook on other people. That's why Jesus said the great, two greatest commandments were to love God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind. But then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Those aren't two really different commandments, are they? They're very similar in a whole lot of ways. Because when I recognize what God has done for me, I'm more than happy to show that to other people. That's what grace is all about. If you're here this morning, you're doubting God's love for you, I would love to talk to you about that. I would love to express what the scriptures say about it. I would love to show you what God has said about his grace and mercy that he extends to you. Won't you join me as we stand and as we sing?